Hello, Grant. How are you doing? Hey, pretty good. How are you? Uh, well, I'm doing fine. And thanks for having this conversation with me. Uh, it's really great to have uh, members of the OpenShift team uh, talking with me and sharing all your opinions and experiences about OpenShift and open source as a whole. And uh, I would like to start like asking you, like, well, about you, uh, if you can introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and your work at OpenShift. Okay, sure. Yeah, so I've been on the OpenShift team at Red Hat since probably about day one. Um, so roughly four years, something like that, back before it was even an official project or product before we had anything built it up from scratch. Um, and before that, I, I was a uh, principal software engineer at Red Hat um, over on the engineering side, IT side of the house. Okay. And currently, what what is your focus in, inside OpenShift? Yeah, so right now, I like to think of myself as a man with many hats. Um, so I'm a developer advocate or evangelist. I also manage all of our evangelists, and I also work a lot on uh, marketing, believe it or not, uh, to uh, developers, so technical marketing. Okay, great. Uh, this year, it seems that the interactivity around the OpenShift uh, Roadshow was really heavy. We, we were having presentations in many cities. Uh, would you like to share some of that? Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. We just had this idea one day on our uh, team mailing list to you know, go around to different cities throughout the uh, country and you know, highlight the new OpenShift uh, release that we had which was OpenShift 3, which was a complete re-platform, re-architecture um, of the system. And we started with like five or six cities in mind. And you know we put together some justification for going to these uh, cities. And once we said we were going to these you know first six cities or so, the demand was absolutely insane, people wanting them in their own location. So we ended up I think last time I counted was like 30 some cities that we ended up going to over a three month span. So it was pretty busy. Um, each of the uh, locations, we tried to do somewhere fun. Um, for instance, I was in, I think it was Minneapolis. One of the first ones we did the uh, baseball stadium there. And so we had the, uh, the roadshow event where people could try out OpenShift at the stadium. And then we all stayed and watch the great game afterwards. We've also done them at tech centers and even bars and, and breweries before. Um, so it's been pretty great. You know, each city, I think we if we could fit 50 people in, we would normally get 150 to 200 people wanting to actually sign up and go, um, which was just crazy. And, you know, it was a lot of work because we'd have to add cities on the fly, um, we'd have to add additional dates. I think we're up to our third date in Washington, D.C. now, for example. Okay. Well, so I'm, I'm imagining that perhaps next year we're going to have another roadshow? Yeah, um, we're talking about it, planning it now. Uh, a lot of people have been asking us to continue the trend to, to bring these, you know, pure tech-focused days to their location. So we're planning on, you know, what, content and where we should go early next year. So you mentioned uh, OpenShift 3, so and that it was important for the roadshow to tell people about, developers about OpenShift 3. Uh, what was it so important about OpenShift 3? What, what was the change, the important change that you had between OpenShift 2 and OpenShift 3? Yeah, so the big deal with OpenShift 3 is OpenShift has been around for many years and a lot of other platform as a service offerings have been as well, but they've all kind of been based on their own implementation of Linux containers, whether that's LXC or, you know, with OpenShift, we created our own Linux container based on SE Linux, Linux control groups, and PAM uh, namespaces for polyinstantiated directories. Um, but what we had seen over the last couple of years is this trend towards standardi standardized container formats. And the OpenShift team and Red Hat realized several years ago that perhaps uh, Docker was going to be the next big thing. And so we bet very early on, on Docker. Um, 
uh, uh, quite honestly, before a lot of people had even heard about it, we recognized that it was going to be a great technology for developers and for running platforms at scale. And so what we decided to do was kind of step back a little bit and just take a break um, from the current platform as a service trends and really think about what we need to do to go beyond platform as a service and to create the next thing in IT that's really gonna be beneficial that evolved out of platform as a service. And so we changed our entire development model uh, on OpenShift 3 in that initially, I, I would say for the first year, year and a half, um, and we weren't very public about this, we did most of our work in the Docker ecosystem itself and contributed just tons of code up to that upstream repository to get it to a state to where we felt comfortable as a product and as a company to be able to support production workloads running on Docker containers. And I believe at the end of the day, um, because of all that work, we ended up uh, and still are the, the number two contributor to Docker. And so we took this Docker container format um, and we wanted to make it readily available to developers to use. So Docker is pretty easy to use as a developer on your local machine, uh, but where things get pretty complicated is when you want to run your applications or your containers um, at scale. And I'm not talking about massive scale, um, even though that's part of the benefits of the OpenShift platform, but even just running two or three containers load balanced with HA proxy or whatever the case may be, that gets pretty complicated pretty quickly for developers. And so once we had uh, implemented the, the Docker stuff inside of the next version of OpenShift, we then realized that to have production class applications, it's more than just the container image format. And so we identified another project at that time called Kubernetes, which quite honestly, no one had heard about when, when we got invested in that. And uh, we worked heavily on the Kubernetes project with Google and uh, we're also the number two contributor to that project. And so those two things are important, both Docker and Kubernetes, because it's, it's good to know that as a team, OpenShift and as a company, we bet on those technologies way in advance. We're talking years ago um, to make them viable. And so the reason we needed Kubernetes, if you're not familiar with it, is to do orchestration and scheduling of your containers. And so what happens is your Docker container actually runs in this uh, concept called a Kubernetes pod, and then you can easily scale those pods up, create replicas of them, and let the underlying platform decide which server that you're going to deploy that new pod or new container on, and then orchestrate and uh, all of the services, load balance, whatever the case may be across all of your pods, whether they reside on, you know, five, 10, or, or a thousand different uh, uh, servers. And so once we got Docker and Kubernetes working, I know this is a very long answer, um, but we realized that uh, Kubernetes and Docker are great, um, but they're not very accessible for the average developer. Um, so think about, you know, your non-startup, non-hipster developer that's kind of behind the bleeding edge curve. They want te technologies to be trusted just a little bit more before they um, start working on them. We realized that the tool sets provided, uh, like I said, we just wasn't very accessible to developers. They had to learn a lot of new technologies. And so what we added on top of Docker and Kubernetes is this workflow um, for both developers and systems administrators to be able to take advantage of containers and running containers um, at scale in production or in any environment, um, honestly, and let developers work that they, let developers work how they work today, whether that's inside of their IDE or on the command line or via web browser, um, to, to let them just focus on their code and not have to worry about the sysadmin aspects of it, and then to let sysadmins allow developers to self-service um, creating these containers and these pods um, with, re with restrictions, obviously. And so, you know, that's what OpenShift 3 is. It's a complete rewrite, a re-architecture, re-platform. Every single line of code is different. Um, we didn't really maintain anything other than core concepts um, that we wanted to, 
to come over into the new system. Well, well actually, actually uh, yeah, yeah. Sort that out. Sort that out. Um, it was quite detailed, and, and I think uh, the viewers are going to appreciate that, your point of view on that. And But uh, now you talk all about that, about OpenShift 3. And even before the entire roadshow was over, uh, OpenShift 3.1 was already announced. So it, it, is, it seems that you basically have to keep adapting to everything that is there and that the entire pipeline is really fast, it's changing. So what, what can we expect to have with OpenShift 3.1? Yeah, so OpenShift 3.1 just further shows our commitment to the platform and to keeping uh, working on it to move it forward to provide great features that people want. Some of my favorite features in OpenShift 3.1 as a developer, because that's my background, that's my history, that's what I do, is the ability to um, do just some great things inside of the web console itself. So you can look at aggregated logs across all of your containers and have them streamed in the web console uh, via WebSocket connection. It's very cool. Um, so you don't have to like fire up your command line and log into pods and tell files and, and all of that stuff. You Just with a single click from the pod, you can look at the log files. We also have this topology visualization tool, right? And so if you have an application deployed on the OpenShift platform. And let's say that application consists of, you know, five uh, front end uh, containers that servicing your, you know, your web UI, whether that's uh, JavaScript, Node.js, or whatever the case may be. And then that talks to a set of microservices or some back end services that's deployed across three different containers. And then all of that's talking to a replicated Mongo database across five containers, and it's all fronted with a HA proxy load balancer. Well, that you know, when you start talking about real applications like this, um, it gets very complicated, and to understand all of the touch points and integrations between these two containers, and so we developed this tool that'll you know you just click a button inside the web UI and it draws this map of your application and shows all of the pods and how the um, communication happens between how the traffic flows um, out through the ex external route down into the database. And so that allows you to quickly, you know, visualize the topology of your application. Another one of my uh, favorite features is the, uh, the ability to open up a shell or command line tool into a specific container right from inside of the web browser. And so you don't have to, and this is, I actually started using Windows 10 not long ago, and Windows 10 was was kind of a pain for me to get set up as a you know Linux guy because I live and breathe by the command line, and so you know I hate the command.com or cmd.exe or whatever it's called the the default shell that ships with Windows because then you got to install OpenSSH and you got to you know generate keys and the terminal just sucks right. And so what this allows to be able to open up a terminal inside of the web browser is just with a single click of the button. As a Windows user, I can completely ignore all of the stuff that I need to do, whether that's installing PuTTY or whatever the case may be, to open up a exec uh, bash shell on the remote containers. So I just click the button within you know half a second, I'm dropped to a shell. Well, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, so one last question for you. And this one is quite open. Is what is like the future for OpenShift? What, what are your parting thoughts, and what do you think like uh, people should get like out of this conversation that we just had? Yeah, so I believe the future of OpenShift we're going to be focusing uh, more on the developer experience and the user uh, interface designs, whether that's inside of the IDE or in the web UI or even great console tools or REST APIs to really continue down the path of making a container application platform like OpenShift is accessible to as many developers as possible so they can have the benefits of running these new technologies without changing how they work on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Grant, for all your time and your questions. And uh, I do hope to have you here like a 
soon we're going to talk with other members of the team and 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 anytime that you want to share your opinion about OpenShift, open source uh red hat as a whole or just software development uh you're welcome okay cool thanks diego appreciate it thank you